Two remarkable men graced the 20th century, Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. Mohandas Karanchan Gandhi was born in 1869 in a small town of Porbanda on the west coast of India. He attended school in Rajkot, went on to college for one year, but then he left for London to study law. He was 18 years old. Three years later, he became a barrister. He was accepted as a barrister to the High Court of Bombay. Yet Gandhi was very, very shy. It was difficult for him to speak in front of others, in the court and in public. His law practice in Rajkot was not a great success. In addition to his shyness, he found that he was being asked to pay commissions to others to bring him work. Gandhi considered this to be unethical. Later, he was to say, My hesitancy in speech, which was once an annoyance, is now a pleasure. It has taught me the economy of words. Then, a definite offer of work was proposed to him when his brother received this letter. We have business in South Africa. Ours is a very big firm and we have a big case there. If you send your brother here, you would be able to instruct counsel better than ourselves. He would have the advantage of seeing a new part of the world and making new acquaintances. I was tempted by this offer of work because I was already married with family responsibilities. A traditional marriage had been arranged by my parents when I was 13 years old. If I accepted this job offer, I would be able to send money back to India to help in the expenses of the household. In the spring of 1893, a boat sails out from Bombay on its way to Durban. On board is a young lawyer of 23, Mohandas Karanchan Gandhi. My new employer, Abdullah Set, a Muslim, came to meet me. Even as I was leaving the ship, I noticed that the Indians, Hindu, Muslim, Christians and Parsi, were not held in much respect. It was in South Africa that I discovered that I had no rights as a man because I was an Indian. I began to see that South Africa was no country for a self-respecting Indian. Gandhi's sole purpose when he landed in Durban was to win the claims case, to honor his contract, to give good advice to his employer, and to return home after one year. He would remain in South Africa for the next 21 years. Little did he think, as he stepped off that boat from Bombay, that it was here in South Africa that he would begin his life's work for self-realization, a search that would require from him a truthfulness of purpose in all his thoughts and actions, that he would be one of the founding members of the Natal Indian Congress, it was to act as a political body on behalf of Indians in South Africa that he would open up two law offices, one in Durban and one in Johannesburg, that he would help to create two settlements known as ashrams, Phoenix near to Durban and Toy Story Farm near to Johannesburg, that he would set up his own printing press and that he would be imprisoned four times during his stay in South Africa. For the rest of his life, he would communicate with influential people, writers, politicians, journalists, and ordinary people from all over the world. My employer sent me immediately to Pretoria to prepare for the legal case. I had read the law but I had not practiced the law. I studied bookkeeping and I studied Hindu 
and Mohammed Tan Lo. After weeks and months of negotiation, I won the claims case. The case was settled by arbitration. Right from the very beginning, I had tried very hard to bring the two sides together, and I had succeeded. Everyone was happy. I had learned the true practice of law. I had learned to find out the better side of human nature, to find a way to enter into men's hearts. I had won the case. I went back to Durban to prepare to leave for India. Before leaving, a farewell party was given for me. I was there ahead of time for the party. In a newspaper, I saw a reference to a bill before the House of Legislature. I remember saying to my friends and colleagues, if this passes into law, it will make our lot extremely difficult. It is the first nail into our coffin. It strikes at the root of our self-respect. Some Indian merchant said, what can we understand in these matters? We can only understand things that affect our trade. What can we know of legislation? Someone else said to me, you should cancel your passage. Go back on the next boat, and we will fight as you direct us. I replied, if you want me, I will stay. Just as the doors of the Natal Indian Congress were open to all, so was Gandhi's law office. More and more poor laborers came to see him, to seek his advice and to air their grievances. I came to be regarded as their friend. I began to share to the full the sweets and bitters of human experience. This coming together proved to be a new experience for many of us, because all distinctions such as high and low, small and great, master and servant, were forgotten. If I was to lead, to advise, I must acquire self-knowledge, be a man of truth and a man of care. They saw him as a person whose work and word could be trusted. They enjoyed his company and his boundless energy. Everyone felt at ease with him. A state of siege, a state of fear and intimidation was beginning to take hold. One bill would affect in a negative way the Indian trader. It would deprive all Indians of their right to elect members to the Natal Legislative Assembly. And the other bill would impose stringent restrictions on Indians wishing to immigrate to South Africa. Everyone within the Indian community recognized that Gandhi was actively engaged in his own quietly persistent and often courageous way in their joys and sorrows. I had become convinced that the concept of civil disobedience and a truthfulness in thought and action could bring about change. I believed that it could be a way to reach out to people of all religions, to all races, and mobilize their moral energy. I presented this idea to the Natal Indian Congress, and it was accepted as a principle of faith here I stand before you, and I take our solemn oath that I will not submit to these unjust laws. Rising in silence, hundreds of others took the oath along with me. This nonviolent approach, Satyagraha, Satya, for truth, and Agraha, to hold on firmly, became the flame to relight all our hopes. In 1910, after the Boer War and the Zulu Rebellion, the Union of South Africa was created. The South African Supreme Court ruled that Hindu-Muslim-Parsi marriages were invalid in the eyes of the law. Indian wives were concubines without legal status, liable to deportation, and their children were illegitimate. A tax was imposed upon indentured laborers and their families. You may break my bones, you may kill me. You will have my dead body, but not my obedience. These laws will not govern me. Gandhi had written letters, articles. These articles had been sent all around the world. 
but nothing had changed. It was decided that the civil disobedience movement must again move with increasing vigour away from the politics of petitions, of letter writings and publications. So they went back to civil disobedience and into direct action. Three campaigns were undertaken. One was the burning of passes. Another was direct non-violent action against the Asiatic laws. All Indians of both sexes over the age of eight must be fingerprinted. And a third was a great and magnificent Satagraha of 1913. Thousands of people, men, women and children, joined in the march. Arrests and hardships awaited them. They were all aware that they ran the risk of arrest, injury and even death. Sixteen men and women from the Phoenix settlement, including Gandhi's wife, planned to cross the border of the Transvaal into Natal and in this way caught arrest. Gandhi's wife was arrested and sentenced to three months in prison. By November, the group had grown to about 2,000 men, women and children. The government was unable to halt this great upsurge of disobedience. 50,000 miners were on strike and 7,000 of them were in jail. The government negotiated with the non-violent movement and they agreed to set up a commission. The Indian Relief Bill was established and Gandhi and his followers believed that the government would begin to amend all of the injustices being placed against Indians in South Africa. Once again, Gandhi prepared himself to leave South Africa and go home. He was to show India and the world that he had the will and the courage to defy the British Empire and to question its right to exist and its right to continue to exploit and to control India. Years after he left South Africa, Gandhi said, I had no idea of how many great spirits would join our non-violent struggle. Women, as well as men, would emerge, rise up and embrace this movement. I am only just beginning this experiment with non-violence, but it will need many Gandhis to bring this to perfection. My life is my message. The indescribable luster of truth, outshining the sun. In 1918, four years after Gandhi had sailed out of Cape Town Harbour to go home, in a small village between the Kai River and the Natal border, Nelson Mandela was born. It would be here that he would learn to love the open, bright spaces of the trans sky, a beautiful, sweet land of a thousand rivers and streams, green and fertile valleys. But all too soon, in his early teens, he would move away to live in a dark, all dirt, no running water, full of noise, in a shanty town called by everyone the Dark City. He was to become yet another person from the countryside trying to find work in the city. He was born in a South Africa where tensions existed between the Europeans who were believers and upholders of the British Empire on one side and those who wished to create a solely white, dominated Boer Republic of South Africa on the other. He worked during the day as a clerk, and in the night he studied law. He received his law degree, and he set up a law office with Oliver Tambo, who would remain as his friend and mentor for the rest of his life. Right throughout the 1950s, the nationalist government was placing him and other leaders under house arrest, 
restricting their movements and forbidding them to address public meetings. He became a leading member of the African National Congress. The most appalling oppression took place in South Africa under the name of apartheid. Separate laws for each race, white, black, and people of mixed races. In 1952, the African National Congress challenged these unjust laws by leading a national defiance and disobedience campaign. 25,000 women marched in 1956 against apartheid and the carrying of passes. Rallies were held by women's groups all around South Africa. 1,000 women were arrested. Nelson Mandela said that the founders of the African National Congress had witnessed throughout the Gandhi years that the Indian people registered an extraordinary protest against color oppression when they marched and were arrested and imprisoned in their non-violent Transvaal to Durban massive march and disobedience campaign. This was history and we saw it with our own eyes. The African National Congress held an all-in conference in 1955. A Freedom Charter was drawn up. Discussions about its makeup had gone on all around the country. It was truly a people's charter. It would become the guiding force and anchor in South Africa's struggle and search to have freedom and real democracy. It was multiracial. Chief Lutuli, the president of the African National Congress, said, For if you know anything about apartheid, it does seek, in fact, to limit, for no other reason other than that you are black, was the sort of thing I could not tolerate. When Nelson Mandela was 38 years old, a knock came to his door. A policeman had come to arrest him. He was to be charged with high treason. Later, he was to find out that this statement, a warrant has been given for your arrest, was given to 155 other people, black, white, Indian, Asian, and colored. For two years, the high treason trial dragged on. The government lost its case, and they were released. The African National Congress voted to initiate a massive countrywide anti-pass campaign. There was to be a great bonfire of passes. Organized disobedience protests were taking place under the umbrella of a national campaign. It spread through the country like wildfire. The old, the young, all poured out onto the streets. At the year's end, 8,500 had broken the law. The government took no notice. Indeed, they responded with even more determination and cruelty than before. The government opened fire on a crowd in Sharpville, outside of Johannesburg. Scores of protesters died and many were wounded. The African National Congress declared a day of mourning. Crowds of 50,000 or more gathered all over South Africa in small and large towns and townships to grieve and to mourn. 33 organizations, including the African National Congress, were banned, and so were many other leaders. In Langa, a township built only to accommodate black workers, there were clashes with the police, killings and injuries occurred. Nelson Mandela was arrested on the charge of incitement and traveling without valid documents. He was sent to Pretoria prison just as Gandhi had almost 50 years before. He would be taken from that prison to Johannesburg to stand trial with seven other men on a charge of sabotage. On the 11th of June, 1964, eight men 
were sentenced to life imprisonment. They were sent to Robin Island near to Cape Town. Once a leper colony, a place for mental patients, and now in the 1950s it was to be a prison for political prisoners. Robin Island became the place where Nelson Mandela with other political prisoners retained and developed a dream of a free, democratic and multiracial South Africa. Lying in his cell, night after night, year after year, Nelson Mandela had a recurring dream that if he ever left that prison, he would return to an empty house and to an empty South Africa. During those 27 years, terrible things happened. The Soweto student uprising, where Hector Peterson, a 13-year-old schoolboy, was killed by the police. Steve Biko, a student leader, was arrested and he died in prison. President Botha declares to the international anti-apartheid movement, to the United Nations. For a number of years we have been experiencing a fierce onslaught on almost every aspect of our national life. The terrorist bands of Swapo and the ANC are the primary enemy and must be confronted and eliminated. For almost two decades, the struggle for freedom continued. Nonviolence was met with violence because on its side, the government declared a state of emergency, South Africa was under martial law, and well on the way to being a police state with an ideology of apartheid, separateness, and repression. Days of hardship, arrests, and imprisonment, evictions, and forced removals did not bring peace and progress to South Africa, but it brought a South Africa nearer and nearer to a totalitarian police state. New and old coalitions were coming together, nationally and internationally, under the banner of anti-apartheid. Inside and outside of South Africa, great anti-apartheid solidarity movements were being created. The prohibition of the African National Congress, the Pan-Africanist Congress, the South African Communist Party and a number of subsidiary organizations is being rescinded. People serving prison sentences merely because they were members of one of these organizations will be identified and released. After a long time of struggle, separation from those whom he loved, his response was one of reconciliation, of forgiveness, not revenge, of love, not hatred, of peace, not civil war. Tensions arose between various groups. Chris Haney, a dedicated political leader for democracy and freedom, was killed. Reason and compassion prevailed and the world rejoiced. A reconciliation commission was established to heal the injustices and the brutalities of the past. A new South Africa was born, and it lit up the sky, not only for South Africa, but for the whole world.